everyone. Welcome to this webinar for the Future City Competition. Today you're going to hear an exciting presentation series by several leading experts on energy. Thea will be announcing everyone, but I just again want to welcome you. My name is Martin Flans with Bentley Systems, and I uh, hope you have an exciting webinar. With that said, Thea, I turn the webinar over to you. Thank you, Martin, and thank you everyone for coming to today's Fuel Your Future Research Essay webinar. My name is Thea Sarr, and I'm the Director of Programs for the National Engineers Week Foundation, Future City's parent organization. We have three excellent presenters who will discuss issues related to this year's essay, Feel Your Future. If you have a question, please type it into the question box, the little QA box that you see um, at the top of your screen. We'll collect questions as we go and answer them at the end of today's webinar. I would like to extend a special thank you to Bentley Systems for hosting today's webinar. So, uh, before we get started with our three presenters, I would like to invite Mr. Mark Gold, President Nominee of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and an expert in energy and nuclear engineering himself to say a few words of welcome. ASME is this year's essay sponsor and the co-chair of the National Engineers Week. Mark? Greetings. I'm Mark Goldsmith, and I'm delighted to be here with you today for this webinar about the Future City Future, Future Research Essay. ASME is proud to be the chair of E-Week 2012, and we're already hard at work on a range of exciting activities to celebrate engineers and engineering, and we're glad you're joining us. A key focus of our efforts is to attract young people to our profession. The research essay is a great way to do that. Energy is one of the most important issues of our times, so we're definitely looking forward to seeing your essays and your solutions. We also invite you to visit ASME.org for more information about how you can get involved in E-Week 2012. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And now I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Mr. Mark Biaggi. Mark is a professional engineer with Bentley Systems, and as many of you may know, Bentley Systems is a longtime funder of the National Future City Competition, and we really appreciate that. Mr. Biaggi has a strong background in strategy consulting, sustainability, project management, technical consultancy, and engineering design. He brings over 15 years of international experience in applying information technology to both discrete and process engineering industries. Mark Biaggi also represents Bentley in their global power generation industries. For example, at the World Nuclear Association, where he's an active member of, uh, in a number of working groups. Mark, thanks for joining us today. Why don't you tell us about energy capture and storage? That's great. Thanks, Thea. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Mark Biaggi. I'm the Solution Executive for Power Generation at Bentley. The objective of this presentation is just to get you thinking about some of the issues relating to energy capture and storage and to provide some food for thought about possible solutions for your future cities. Around the world, demand for power has never been greater and over the next 20 years is set to almost double. A lot of this power is used in our homes to drive the appliances we all take for granted. And part of the increased demand comes as countries like India and China improve their standard of living. But, of course, most of the power demand is actually from energy-intensive manufacturing industries, aluminium, steel, cement, chemicals, and so on, that are vital to our economies. So how are we going to manage this growth in demand? The power we generate today comes from three main sources, and there are advantages and disadvantages with each. Nuclear power. Nuclear power plants are very expensive to build. The fuel is only found in certain places around the world, and there are concerns about the radiation and long-term waste storage. Fossil plants are cheaper to build, but they emit a lot of pollution into the atmosphere, and one day the coal, gas, and oil is likely to run out. Finally, hydro and renewables. These power plants don't emit any pollution, but they are expensive to build. And while the fuel is free, you can't guarantee it's going to be there when you most need it. So, if we're going to meet 
global demand for power while also reducing emissions, we're going to have to think up some new solutions. Now, it's important to realize that there is plenty of energy available in the system. A shortage of energy is not the problem. The Bottomless Well, a book by Peter Huber and Mark Mills, is an excellent book to get you thinking about the real issues with energy in the world today. Among other things, it tells us that just six hours of sunshine in the desert is equivalent to all the energy humankind uses in one year. The sun alone provides 10,000 times more solar energy than humans consume. The book also tells us the trick is turning the available chaotic forms of energy, like heat and waves and wind, into increasingly ordered and increasingly useful forms, and then delivering to where it's needed. For example, turning heat into a spinning shaft, then that spinning shaft into electrical power, then refining the electrical power into highly ordered forms like laser beams, radio waves, telecommunications, power that's precise enough to drive gigahertz microprocessors for cool computer games. You get the idea. So, thinking about your cities, let's think about for a minute about where they are and where the power is consumed. The world map shows the main centers of population. So you can see the main areas, uh, the brightest areas, are where most of the power is consumed. And I've drawn a few red ellipses here to show you where the main areas of power is consumed. Now, Let's turn our attention to wind energy. I'm sure you've all seen wind turbines. Well, scientists have mapped the Earth to understand where the best available wind resources are. And in this case, what you're about to see, the dark red areas, are the best. Now, if we overlay the ellipses, again, showing the main centers of population, we can very quickly see that the problem is the best wind resources are most often found furthest from the areas of population. And electricity doesn't travel very well. It's expensive to travel. Now, let's zoom in one small country that's very dear to my heart, and that is Scotland. Here, the main centers of population are found in the central belt and up the east coast of the country. Now, alongside tartan, bagpipes, golf, and whiskey, Scotland is actually blessed with huge wind, wave, and tidal energy resources. Even so, we're restricted where we, where we can put these turbines because tourism is such a large part of the economy. We can't just ruin the natural beauty of the landscape. So the best resources are furthest from the centers of population. And transmission is expensive, unsightly, and inefficient. We're just showing here the areas in dark green are offshore wind, lighter green is onshore, and then also there is uh, increasing amounts of marine wave and tidal energy forms. And of course the challenge being, how do we get that energy that would be produced in those areas close to the centers of population? Well, one idea would be, rather than transmitting the energy along pylons, why don't we use it closer to the source to make hydrogen by electrolyzing water? This hydrogen can easily be compressed and liquefied, which means it can be stored. Furthermore, a hydrogen pipeline would be a lot cheaper and less unsightly than electricity pylons. The hydrogen could then be piped to the main centers of population where it could be used to fuel the growing hydrogen economy. Fueling things like small power plants, industrial processes, public transports, and of course the big advantage is when you burn hydrogen, the only emission is water. The same issue applies to solar. Solar power, the best resources are where nobody lives in the desert. So, a group of German banks are getting together to figure out how they might be able to put 
concentrating solar power plants in the deserts of northern Africa and use high voltage direct current transmission to northern Europe. This is called the Desert Tech Initiative. So, um, there are two basic types of uh, solar power plants. First of all, there's solar thermal power plants, and those uh, reflect the heat of the sun and the light of the sun and use that heat to, for example, create steam and use that steam to drive a generator. And the other type of uh, solar power is called solar photovoltaic, and that's where the sun's light is converted directly into energy. And they're, the solar thermal plants are more suitable for large energy-intensive applications. Solar photovoltaic is the kind of thing you'll see on top of uh, many houses and smaller uh, applications. But the basic problem is, what happens when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine? This is called intermittence. Now, I'm sure you know from your science classes, energy can't be created. It can just be turned from one form into another. Of course, we'll all be familiar with batteries. That's a form where chemical energy is used. There are other forms, though, as well. And here we're showing uh, kinetic energy. For example, a flywheel would be a very good way of, of energy storage for smaller applications. But one method that's used very commonly uh, around the world is what's called pump storage hydropower plants. And that's where you're using potential energy of uh, water pumped up into a higher reservoir, which can then be released when it's required. And that can be used for balancing out load so that, for example, when the sun isn't shining or when the wind isn't blowing, you can release the water back down the hill. So there are many different types of energy storage. And I've included a table here that shows some of the other concepts and some of the other new technologies that are coming along. So, for example, with solar power plants, instead of using water to drive the turbines, they're looking at storing the energy in the form of molten salt. That molten salt has a much higher heat capacity. It can retain an awful lot of that heat. And then there are other some other uh, quite sophisticated mechanical designs that are coming out using nanomaterials and micro material technology so that these materials can store up an immense amounts of energy, much more than a, a spring or an elastic band. What I wanted to talk about finally was some of the perhaps more futuristic concepts would be to use things like uh, mi microbial fuel cells where the bacteria, uh, special bacteria are used that generate hydrogen uh, automatically. Uh, that's part of what they do. And perhaps that hydrogen could be used to drive small electronic devices. Ordered energy storage would be another one. And then finally, the great hope uh, for everyone is nuclear fusion. They're building an experimental reactor in the south of France right now that rather than using fission from uh, things like uranium, is fusing together hydrogen atoms and using the energy produced in that and has the promise of yielding far more power uh, than, than ever before. Um, so these are some of the, the futuristic concepts you may also want to consider. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. That was super interesting. The next presenter we have is Mr. Dick Williams. Um, Mr. Williams joined Shell, another longtime sponsor of Future City, back in 1980, after receiving his electrical engineering degree from Penn State. He's worked in a variety of Shell's pipeline regions as an engineer. He's then returned to Houston for several positions in the business, including base chemicals. And then he went on to St. Louis as the Mid-Continent um, District Superintendent. In 2008, Dick was appointed president of Shell Wind Energy. Shell's wind activities include operating 11 wind farms, 8 in North America, and 3 in Europe. Thank you, Dick. We look forward to hearing you talk about uh, wind. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, Mark just gave gave a wonderful, wonderful overview of the energy picture in the world. If you take a look at look at the world, um, we really are in transition. And for the students out there, they are really living in a very exciting time because, um, 
as you know, we've all been comfortable with the fossil fuels, the coal and the gasolines and the natural gas and what have you. And what you're going to find is that as you get older and work towards the future, uh, the fossil fuels will decline. We're still going to have them for a long time, but but they will decline. So so you'll be working on the next next phase of energy. And and we talked about some earlier. Uh, I'd like to talk about the wind, which is the area we work in. If you go from the left to the right, it just shows where the different energies live spectrum. And so and so over over on the left, it's for transportation. So you have your oil and your biofuels and and a little bit of natural gas, and that feeds your airplanes and your trains and the trucks. And then in the middle, you have, um, you know, gas and coal and nuclear, which is what you typically think of in your power plants. And they feed, feed your industry and your factories and, and they make fertilizer and things like that. And on the left side is pretty much the transportation arena, you know, cars, trains, airplanes, things like that. In the middle is the industrial and, and the power generation for uh, factories and what have you, uh, fertilizer. And then the far, far right is basically where we live in the renewables, and it's, it's, it's power generation for your house. So it's for your, your uh, lights and iPads and things like that. And what I, what I don't think the young people heard was that um, they're, they're living in a very exciting time because we're going to have fossil fuels for a long time, but they're going to start tailing off. And as they tail off, and as Mark said before, as the overall the overall energy use is going up, uh, you're going to have to find something that replaces it. And so that's what you all need to start thinking about. So why wind power? Basically, wind is free. You know, costs us money to put these up, but it's not dependent upon the price of fuel. Um, there are not any greenhouse gas emissions, and so we don't make any carbon, and we don't use any water, and water is becoming a very, very uh, important thing. You really look at it, there's a lot of wind every day, and you saw the wind map before, and I brought one that I'll show in just a minute of the U.S. If you look up in the upper right-hand corner of this, this is, this is a little, little picture, and we actually use this with a lot of folks. And it shows how you have the wind farm, but it's actually hooked into a substation that also has a hydroelectric dam and it has a, has a coal or a nuclear plant. And then all those feed together to feed the houses. And our turbines that we install are typically one and a half to two megawatts. That's the size of them. And, and one of those turbines feeds about four to five hundred homes each year. So, so we have over a thousand turbines in our fleet. So y'all can do some quick math to see how many, many homes. And if you also see, we also reduce uh, about uh, a, about a half a ton of carbon each year into the the atmosphere. Here's one of the most exciting maps we get to show, and it's a wind map of the United States. And um, it looks just like the weather radar that you see on TV. And the big message of this map is look in the central part of the United States. Yellow is good, red is even better. That's where all the wind is here. And as you know, all of the load centers are on the coasts. They're up in the northeast, they're in the southeast. They're where I live in Houston, Texas. Uh, they're on the west coast. And so the big question is, you have all this wind and all this potential electricity in the central part of the United States. How do you get it out? And, and to get it moved out, you use uh, uh, transmission lines. When we are looking for where to build a wind farm, we go out and we take wind measurements. And so we have about 60 of these uh, uh, devices up around the country. We call them MET masts, meteorological masts. They're about 100 feet tall, and they take wind and pressure uh, readings and temperature readings at about every 15 meter um, or, or 10 meter levels. And then they have a little cell phone on them, just like your iPhone or your BlackBerry if you have that. And they have a solar panel, and every night they phone that data back to our computers here in Houston. And so 
And so we have engineers and we have wind resource people that come in and get this data, and they get all excited about it every morning because it's something new. But that's how we decide where to site our wind farms, you know, how big they are, how we orient them towards the wind and everything like that. So, so it, it, it's, it's really a fascinating thing. <clears throat> and then going on, after we have that wind data, the next graph shows how many steps we have to go through to actually build this wind farm. And we start with the preliminary project area using the map, map that I just showed you. And then we uh, uh, will overlay a road map to see if we can get the parts in there. Each, each wind turbine takes about 14 trucks to get it in there. And then we have about another 100 trucks of cement and things. And so you just have to make sure it's accessible. Then you have to make sure all of your landowners actually want that business there on their land. And then is there transmission? Mark talked about that before. How do you get that electron out? And then is it enough wind to actually support a large wind farm or a small wind farm? Then we start worrying about the birds and, and the bunnies and the flying tree squirrels. And offshore, we use underwater sonar, and we watch all the fish and the whales and the dolphins and things that swim through our wind farms. And so this whole process has about another five or ten layers to it on the top of it. So if all of us on this phone call decided to build a wind farm today, each one of us would probably have graduated high school, if not college, before we went to the wind farm. That's how long it takes to get through all this. A very, very important part of this, we were talking about the transmission, and this is a picture of one of our substations at one of our sites. And so our wind turbines are all wired back to the substation, and then the power goes out on the, on the uh, grid and eventually gets to your house or your grandmother's house or your school or wherever it goes. If we were to build the transmission line, it would take probably six to nine years to do that also. And there's a lot of studies in this because we have to find out if the transmission operator can take the power, if there are lines in the area, who else it's, it's hooked up to. Then we have to write contracts with them. We have to pay the money to actually buy, buy all the cable and the towers, get it all installed, and, and then get it uh, um, hooked up. So, you know, a lot of different types of work needs done here. So you all are probably looking at designing your, your city, and there's a lot of things that, that you have to look at. A lot of the same things we have to look at when we're building our wind farms. And uh, I talked about the wind resource assessment and the transmission. Then we do all kinds of biological surveys. So we look at the fish and we look at the birds. You know, are there wetlands? Are there protected species? Are there noxious species, which are, you know, snakes, things like that? We do cultural research, and, and this is like what kind of history is there. We have uh, we've developed some very interesting wind farms in Hawaii that we had to hide from any of the hiking trails in the national parks, and we had to hide the wind farm from the local hotels also. But the most interesting thing was, the sites had about 80 religious temples on them, old, old-time religious temples on them. So we had to work around how do we take care of that. We have all the economic stuff. How much money are we going to make? How many taxes, taxes are we going to pay? Then we start, start looking at all the engineering and the noise things. Uh, the visual assessment is big. What are you going to see when you look at our wind farm? Are people living next to us going to worry about it there, things like that? And the big thing is safety. And so uh, how do we operate this safely? How do we construct it uh, during construction? How do we keep all of the workers fed? How do we keep them housed? How do we keep them safe? How do we provide medical care? Things like that. So it's all these things that go in. Now, if you look at the next slide, here's what I think the best story, the best part of this whole story is, is all the different types of skills and specialties and, and, and things that we need to build this. You know, a lot of people look at these engineering projects or they would look at, look at the pipeline projects. I, I used to build and pipeline or operate. And we need people who are good with environmental things. You know, 
who know about the birds and the fish and the plants and everything. Um, we need transportation experts. How do we get our wind farm and our turbines from the factory to the uh, uh, site in the field? We need health and safety people. You know, how do we keep our people safe? Uh, weather forecasting is huge. You'll probably see, see the weather people on TV every night. Uh, at some of our wind farms, we have two and three different weather services giving us information so we can plan our maintenance, plan our construction, and things like this. We need the electrical engineers to help with the power. We need civil engineers to help us with our foundations. We need mechanical engineers to help on the installation. So, so there's all kinds of things. But if you aren't technical, you look on the right side, there's all kinds of exciting things there too. We need the marketing people, business development people. We need, we need a lot of financial people. How do you keep all that straight? We need people who can <clears throat> talk, talk with the governments, talk with the other landowners and what have you. We need regulatory and compliance people to keep us out of jail, make sure we have all our permits and operating, uh, real estate and, and contract. And, you know, a funny story about how I got to be an engineer was up until I was in seventh grade, I wanted to be a camera operator in a TV station. I thought that was just absolutely the coolest job in the world. I had a seventh grade science teacher. I still remember his name, and that was all many years ago. His name was Mr. Zabrita. And Mr. Zabrita helped five of us get amateur radio licenses when we were in seventh grade. So I was, you know, basically nine or ten years old. And that just got me interested in engineering, and I decided at that point that's, that's what I wanted to do with my life. And I got my engineering degree and went to work, but, but since doing that, I've had over 20 jobs with Shell, and I've gotten to do all kinds of different things, and I've done many of the things in this list. And so, uh, you know, technical degrees are great. Other degrees are great, too. The important thing is that you learn, you know, you know, go to school. So if you look at the next picture, I thought you might be interested in how we actually build our wind turbine. So if you look at this picture, that, that tower that you see in, in the upper left actually came in four different sections. And so that red crane stacked all those towers, and it's lifting what's called the nacelle, which is where all of our equipment is, up to the top. And that's the top set of pictures. That nacelle is the size of a school bus. And then if you look at the bottom, we actually build our rotor, which is the three blades in the hub, we build it on the ground, and then we lift it up and bolt it in place. And from the upper left-hand corner until the lower right-hand corner is about a day and a half to actually construct it but, it. but it may take you eight years to get all the permits and all the engineering and all the planning in place to do it. So, so that's pretty exciting. It's a picture of our Colorado Green wind farm, which is south of Lamar, Colorado. And uh, this is what it looks like after it's built. Those are the Rocky Mountains off into the, the uh, distance there and an access road. And what's really neat about this is that you see they're still farming underneath the wind turbines and, and they can still graze cattle. And so you can build a wind farm and then at the same time you can graze cattle or you can grow soybeans for biofuel or you can grow corn for 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 ethanol or things like that. And so, so you can really, really get a lot of energy out of one little piece of land here. So uh, I know it's quick. I appreciate you uh, sticking with me, but it really is, it really is, is a fascinating business. And um, you know, I'd like to reiterate one thing Mark said, is that at the end of the day, it is not going to be one energy source that wins the, the, the race. It's going to be putting together multiple energy sources. So how do you put together your pump hydro storage with your wind or your wind with your solar or your hydrogen with your solar? And that's something that, that I would hope you all start working on because, you know, at the end of the day, we need to figure out how to put all these sources together going forward. Wow, Mr. Williams, uh, that was so uh, wonderful and interesting to hear. I particularly liked all, hearing all the different ways and information that you have to uh, collect before you decide where you're going to put a wind farm. Uh, thank you very much.
welcome. Our final speaker today is Shannon Hass. And Shannon is, uh, has been a teacher for 29 years in three school districts. She has taught all grade levels in a variety of programs, but most of her t teaching um, experience is focused on grades four to eight. She has a bachelor's degree in elementary education and a master's in special education, as well as an advanced coursework in endorsement and instructional strategy and talented and gifted education. But the most important thing about that you need to know about Shannon is last year, her Future City team won the Best Essay Award at last year's national competition. And she is going to give us some pointers on writing a winning essay. Shannon? Hello, everyone. Today I will explain how I approach and facilitate the essay component of Future City. And to the students who may be listening, I am so thrilled that you have joined your teachers and mentors on this exciting and rewarding journey, and good luck to all of you. Students need time to question, discuss, construct meaning, and make connections before they feel they have something to write. I know that may seem very obvious, but sometimes I think we may be in such a hurry to complete all the components of SC4 that we fail to take enough time for students to learn in depth. We begin Future Cities as a whole class group, researching and learning together. The use of current data regarding concepts such as energy use is very helpful to stimulate curiosity. We may delve into a topic as a whole class, or we may use techniques such as jigsaw groups, which allow students the responsibility to teach their peers. This fall, the students' first days were used to explore suggested websites in the handbook rather than learning about the rules and components of FC4. Guest speakers, videos, websites, field trips if possible, on many topics associated with FC4, even those beyond the essay, help to increase their awareness and nurture their interest in future problem solving and technology. As we learn, costs, benefits, risks, or pros and cons are routinely or explored as well as documented on graphic organizers or a structured column note page or even a mind map. And all of those provide students with more structure for their learning. This year, through our exploration and discussion, we're also analyzing how the various energy sources impact the environment. Although students are aware of the essay component, we don't discuss topics in the beginning of the process. And along the way, I will ask them for short or mini responses to posed questions either to begin class, as group work during class, or as individual homework. Uh, the guide students thinking questions in the educator's handbook could be modified into mini writing and responding assignments for students. As their exposure to new concepts increases, targeted classroom exit questions can be utilized to provide insight as to what the students are thinking. The key here is to provide a variety of ways for students to express their thinking and writing. These just happen to be responses that could be used for late, later in the essay writing. For example, a classroom entrance question this year might be to have them evaluate the design process steps and then identify what areas do you feel strong in or what areas do you feel weaker in. Or a classroom exit question could be what are some of the environmental risks of nuclear power. My students also keep a research and reflection notebook without any rules or guidelines from me. I think it's important that they create their own meaning and their own organizational patterns. Students need not only support, encouragement, assistance with the focus and audience, but also the autonomy to explore their own ideas. After my teams are selected, I utilize Monday progress meetings to hear what students are thinking and learning regarding the model building process, as well as the research details that are necessary for the city narrative and the essay. By asking them probing questions, I work to assist in clarifying their ideas and focus. Occasionally, I act, as to, act to facilitate the discussion among team members as they grow in their understanding of how to work as a team. As we approach the essay itself, teams are well on their way to understanding their selected topics, the pros, the cons, as well as further research that's needed to understand or answer remaining questions or extend their depth of their understanding. Students need strong writing examples, and they need explicit ex instruction, modeling, time to write, time to reflect, and time to share. During our writer's workshop phase used to craft the essay, all the students begin by brainstorming what features make good writing, 
and students never disappoint in their understanding of what should be in the writing. Individuals and then groups prioritize the importance of the features they've identified. We then read models of good writing, other essays, but also those from past FC4 winners. As we read, we note the features that we previously discussed and see if they're apparent in the writing, discuss the notion of how sophistication of writing varies. As teams, students complete a graphic organizer guided by the essay rubric where students explore each of the rubric entries and then provide support or evidence of their learning. Through the discussion of the rubric, we create an essay plan outlining what should be covered in the paragraph forming the essay. Many lessons utilizing modeling and examples are a key component, and these can vary from instruction on topic and detail sentences to writing conclusion or even outlining thoughts. Other lessons may include analyzing sentence structure or vocabulary. The responses and reflections written earlier help to shed light on what weaknesses are present in the student writing. Students continue to write the essay as a team until the many lessons and the first drafts are completed. After the first draft, students compare the rubric and the graphic organizer with the essay to determine if all those requirements are present and in the necessary depth. They're encouraged to go beyond the word limit at this point. During the next phase, one student on each team assumes control of the essay, while the remaining team members focus on the other FC4 components. During a teacher conference, I read their essay aloud, providing an important opportunity for them to hear what has been written. And I think frequently students will hear mistakes or missed opportunities they would pass by when reading it by him or herself. I use probing questions again to continue to refine their thinking. The student then makes revisions, and then all writing stops. Yes, I said all writing stops for several days or even longer. I think students need time to reflect. They need time to walk away from the writing so when they return, they have a better perspective on what they've written. And once, they're, once they do return, they're much more able to add those changes. Eventually, the essay writer is responsible for essay conferencing with the remaining team members, and this could occur several times during the writing process. And since all team members were involved in the learning and the early stages of the writing, they are quite able to provide sound insight. During the essay phase, parallels between the writing process and the engineering design process can be drawn. It's important to show students that the design process can be used to solve problems, not just by engineers, but by anyone needing to evaluate options to make a decision. An example might be, the process students use to take all that research that they complete and narrow it for a thousand word essay. How do they make those decisions? What do they think about? After being asked to do this webinar, I was very curious and I wanted to know, better understand what students perceived about the instruction I provide for them. And here's an example of what they said. I thank you and best wishes in your essay writing adventures. Shannon, thank you so much. That was very informative. We've uh, come to the question and answer period. Okay. Thank you, Thea. Uh, if you are a mentor listening, please write down this link that is on the screen. We will be joining and having a very brief mentors meeting. It will be the first meeting of several throughout the competition period. And it will be just a brief meeting, kind of giving you a what do you need to know to get going with your mentoring this year and helping those students. Please uh, uh, be polite and... Excuse me. I have a question. What areas would you say we should not build our city in? Okay, the question is, what areas should a city not be built in? And yes. we'll go with Mark first on response. Hi there. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, you know, that's quite a difficult question to answer because um, there are many considerations, really, for a city to survive. You've got to think about the, the economy. You've got to think about transportation. You've got to think about how it's close, uh, its proximity to where they can sell goods and services as well. So um, sometimes thinking only about the energy that you're going to have for that city um, isn't isn't just enough. So it's a real balance. You've you've got to you've got to consider uh, 
many different factors to, to consider where to put it. Okay, thank you, Mark. Dick, would you like to add anything to that? You know, I, I probably can't can't add much. That was that was a good answer. But you know, what y'all might want to do is uh, draw a Venn diagram. You all probably all worked with those, but in each one of the circles, you know, is it hard to get to, or is it easy to get to? Is it hard to get get uh, water to? Is it hard to get energy to? Things like that. And I think. You can put cities many, many places. There's probably no perfect place for a city. But if you really think about what you're trying to accomplish and put all those on, on one piece of paper and look at that, I, I think you'll find out that there are places that, that you probably don't want to build cities. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Dick. I, I have a question. <laughs> Go ahead. How do we visually see you guys on our monitors? Ah. Oh, you don't want that to see me. I'm too ugly. <laughs> you don't want to see me. <laughs> well, perhaps uh, in the future, the technology will be a lot more advanced, and you'll be able to see a nice streaming web camera. Uh, a lot of you may already be doing that now, chatting uh, on perhaps your parent's phone or something on an iPhone and chatting back and forth. But uh, today it was oh, just that would be easy. You can build okay, it into your next question. City. And just and on behalf of one of the students, they'd like to know, as you, someone spoke, I think it might have been Mark uh, or um, Dick, about uh, the protecting animals from the turbines. And we were curious if you could elaborate on uh, what technology exists today in terms of sonar for whales that could be hurt by underwater turbines. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, a couple things. What we have found offshore, we have an offshore wind farm in the Netherlands, is that our sonar watches for fish. And, and what we have found there is that it has become a very rich environment, a very rich marine environment. And instead of fish leaving the area, we now have an abundance of fish because you have marine growth on the uh, structures holding the turbines in the water. And it's no longer a navigation zone for uh, ships and so and so it's been just the opposite of what the environmentalists thought would happen. Onshore, we primarily are concerned about birds, and uh, what we do, do there is, is when we're designing the wind farm, we go through two or three years of bird migration studies, and we use radar and we use cameras and everything, and we have to watch the migration patterns for two full, three full years. And birds are great creatures of habit. They are, they are, they are very, very, uh, uh, certain times of the day, certain times of the year, they feed and they, and they flock and nest and all that stuff. And so what we do is we can adjust either where we put the turbine or we can adjust when we run the turbine. So if a certain part of the year we know that the birds are nesting or feeding early in the morning. We, we can shut the turbine off in the morning and let the birds, birds do all their thing. And at one wind farm, um, we've actually found that the birds are flying through our wind farm because the bears are chasing them out of a park. And so what we are going to do is we're going to bear-proof the park so the bears leave so the birds stay home and don't fly, fly through our wind farm. So there's all kinds of different things we can do. Outstanding. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Okay, we've got time for maybe one to two more questions. Um, I have another question about the nuclear power plants. Go ahead. Um, I feel like nuclear power plants are dangerous to the environment. Okay, I believe the question is, uh, do nuclear power plants pose a danger to the environment? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mark, we'll start with you. Yes, uh, well, I'm happy to take that question. It's a very good question. And, you know, that's a big question that's being debated uh, in the industry. You know, there's a big debate about, uh, you know, when to get the fuel for nuclear power plants. It's, it's quite an abundant material and you're able to find it in various places in the world. And the production of that material is is of limited impact to the environment. 
And then when the material, when that fuel is used in a nuclear power plant, of course, that nuclear power plant is then, it's not emitting any carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So there's no noxious emissions. And, you know, for many, many years, uh, these plants have been very, very safe in operations and they've been, been proven to be a very safe technology. The challenge that we have is both in, in the very unusual and very unfortunate incident, like what happened in, in Japan. Uh, now, what happened in Japan, of course, you know, it was a, an extreme event. And, and, of course, the nuclear industry is looking at how, uh, how they can try and, you know, minimize that ever happening again and put in, in place very strong safety measures to deal with that. And then the other problem is that at the end of the, the fuel life, when it comes back out of that reactor, there can be a very long storage period that, that, that uh, some of the high-level radioactive material has to be stored for a long period of time. So, but it's a very small volume of material. So it's a balance, you know, which is more important to us? Can we find places on the planet that we can put that, uh, that radioactive material that it can be stored safely for a very long time and not pose any threat? And is that better? than today pumping a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere to meet our, our energy needs. And that's, these are the, the problems that we face. There's no easy answers. There's, there's lots of shades of gray that have to be considered. Um, my own uh, personal belief is that I think nuclear power is a great technology. It's a, it, it's a technology that has developed greatly over the, even the last 50 years. And the, the future for that technology as part of a balanced mix of power generation types, you know, it's a very important, very good base load uh, generating technology that we should use. All right. Thank you, Mark. And Thank you, Mark. If, if anyone has any questions for Shannon, Shannon did a great job, too. So if we can have the final question, go to the teacher. Shannon, I have a question for you. Yes. As far as um, teaching this goes, how do you set it up in your classroom? Is it a long-term project? How does it incorporate into your curriculum, I guess, is the question I'm curious about. Um, I teach in a middle school, and uh, these students come to me daily in a classroom that we would call, it's an exploratory, so it's not part of the core instruction, but it would be a time when they might have music or PE, and we have some industrial and art and stuff like that. But they come to me for future cities during that time period. Um, I actually start with a whole class, and um, by the end of the first quarter, which comes up uh, October 25th, I have to winnow down those large groups to four teams. So we will already have one round of competitions um, by the end of October here. So they're crazily trying to prepare all the different aspects so that they can see if they go on to compete. Wow. Okay. Thank you. All right, everyone, that's the time for the day. So, again, if you'd like to ask some general questions, there's the info at futurecity.org at the top of the page. Thank you, Martin and Bentley Systems, for hosting today's webinar, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is Thea signing You're off. welcome. Welcome, Thea. Have a great day. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.